A patrolman first spotted the tornado at 132nd and Q Streets in southwest Omaha at 429 Tuesday afternoon. This 8mm film was taken by Dr. William Lipscomb, looking southwest from atop a seven-story building on the University of Nebraska Medical School campus. On the right, the Holiday Inn at 72nd and Grover. The tornado was, at this point, to the south of the interstate, perhaps about now tearing into the Wentworth Apartments near 84th and Q. For a brief moment, it appears that a roof is being torn from a building and sucked into the funnel. The Weather Bureau says there were finger tornadoes reaching out of the main funnel cloud. It is evident in this sequence. Then the aftermath. These particular scenes were filmed just moments later. Residents just beginning to leave their shelters. The initial panic, the shock and disbelief at what they saw. The arrival of police and fire department emergency vehicles. Some of the residents in the affected areas later recall their experiences. I was cooking uh, uh, my dinner and all of a sudden when I, uh, I heard the siren blowing and, and they said that it was as far as the aquarium, I rushed downstairs and I, I got under the pool table. looking out the back window and I was looking at this form of clouds, you know, and it just shattered all over the place. And then uh, it just started forming one big, uh, huge funnel, you know. And then it hit this barn and we saw it. We were watching it and it just shattered and the roof and everything. We just went flying pieces and everything. And then uh, we started to head towards the basement right when it got uh, two blocks right behind our back window over here. And that was the last we saw of it. <laughs> I look 
looked up in the sky and I saw a lot of little pieces of things flying around the air. It looked like ashes until they got closer and I saw shingles and things like that fall in the yard. My wife kept watching and then I heard something sound like a jet airplane coming in, you know. Well, then I put it all together and knew what was happening. We'd already had the kids. We took the necessary precautions and took the kids and put them underneath the pool table right away. And then uh, I finally got my wife downstairs. She didn't realize, you know, that things were really going to happen. And we got her underneath the pool table and then all of a sudden everything started blowing up. It just hit right then. How did you know it was coming? Well, my son, yeah, we heard it from the radio, and then my son was just sitting there and watching, and then all of a sudden, The northernmost point of extensive damage. One of the three fatalities occurred here. Police conducted a search through the debris, concerned that there might be another body. The front of Baker's supermarket was caved in. A huge girder crashed down atop the cash registers, and employees used metal bars to pry open the cash drawers and get at the day's receipts. The 50 persons in the store ran to the back, and no one was injured. I've lived in uh, tornado country all of my life, and I have never seen anything that begins to compare with the total devastation in certain areas uh, in Omaha. This would be a night for many of searching for friends and relatives and personal belongings, of finding temporary shelter, a night for police and National Guardsmen. By nightfall, 800 National Guardsmen and Army Reservists had secured the disaster area. Hours earlier, Mayor Zerinsky had declared a state of emergency. 
Within minutes, Governor Exxon declared West Omaha a disaster area, committing National Guardsmen to patrol. Despite the extremely tight security, there were sporadic reports of looting in the disaster area. Before the week was out, 1,200 guardsmen and other military personnel were on duty in Omaha. It wasn't until early Wednesday morning, after the initial shock began to wear off, that the extent of the devastation was brought into perspective. From the air, a wide swath of destruction was clearly visible. From the city's southwestern boundary, northeastward to 72nd Street, then northward into the Benson area, a distance of some 10 miles, covering a 2,000 square block area of the city. Below, disaster victims picked through the debris looking for personal possessions, and at the same time wondered how anyone could have survived. 5,200 persons were left homeless. Now the roof's uh, blown off your house. Uh, the whole the whole house is destroyed. What are you going to do now? I I don't know. I do, I just don't know where, where I'm at right now. Do you have a place to stay? Yeah, over my son's home. Yeah. Do you know anything about your insurance? Uh, no, I don't know yet. I notify them, but I don't know yet. You're lucky in a way. Lucky. Uh, th this is a miracle to me. I, uh, well, and even uh, that I was here under the pool table, all of that uh, basement windows, uh, that glass was flying right under it, and I kept moving back. And I'm all cut up. I, I just, uh, it, it's just too much. I, I, did, I couldn't believe it would happen to me. Uh, you, you see it on the TV in different places, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I'm just uh, upset, I tell you, I'm just upset. Well, we were down in the basement, roaring. I looked out the window and I could see the debris flying in the air. And uh, so we got down in the corner here, and then we could hear the house going. We could hear it cracking and popping. And I had pressure in my ears. And what are you going to do now? I don't know. No more house. Apartment, maybe. Had about $4,000 worth of singing equipment in the basement, and it's all wiped out. That's the only thing that's left is what's in the basement. Found a typewriter, and a, that's about it. That's my refrigerator way in the backyard there. I mean, there's, I don't know what I'm going to do. Guess what everybody else is going to do, just pitch in and help. On top of one pile of debris, a young man futilely whacking away with a small hatchet. What kinds of things are you looking for? What are you most concerned about finding? Mostly just like, you know, insurance papers, wedding certificate, you know, mo sentimental things more than anything else. But uh, it's kind of pretty hard to find anything, and it's kind of a mess. We're how just long, mostly rummaging. How long you been at it? Well, my husband had off work yesterday. They worked all day yesterday on it, and then we, he took off again today, so we've been working all day on it. We've got a bunch of the friends here helping and relatives, and the Red Cross has been in. Everybody's just been great with helping. I'm just glad we weren't home. <laughs> Late Wednesday afternoon, President Ford declared Omaha a federal disaster area and ordered all federal agencies to assist disaster victims in any way they could. Within hours, federal disaster officials began arriving in the city to establish disaster centers. The twister sideswiped Omaha's Bergen Mercy Hospital, causing an estimated five to seven and one half million dollars in damage. The feverish but efficient work of hospital staff to move 450 patients into the corridors in a very short time is one of the more heroic tales to come out of the storm. How much warning did the hospital have? 
Well, the, the uh, media had been uh, giving us uh, warnings all afternoon as far as storm warnings, but it was probably, um, I, I would guess, 10 minutes warning in total from that we had to move patients away from the direction of it. Despite the extensive damage to the hospital, none of the patients suffered injuries. Only two employees sustained minor cuts. In addition, the hospital, because of its proximity to the disaster area, handled dozens of tornado emergency cases. In Westgate, District 66's elementary school was completely destroyed. Where walls once stood, teachers walked into their classrooms to retrieve what personal belongings they could find. The 480 children had left the school about an hour before. Custodian Chuck McNulty, the only one there, threw a rug over himself and walked out afterwards with some scratches. The school building will be raised and a new one built in its place. At Lewis and Clark Junior High, the roof blown away, windows smashed, classrooms in a shambles. The 1,300 students have been reassigned for the remainder of the term. It's hoped reconstruction will be completed in time for the fall term. The 50 students and adults here when the tornado hit took refuge along an inner hallway and none was seriously hurt. More than 5,500 students at various schools in the tornado's path got unexpected vacations for several days because of damage or loss of power. Right after the tornado, there were an estimated 35,000 persons without electrical power. OPPD said the twister narrowly missed four substations providing power to thousands of homes in West Omaha. The First Methodist Church severely damaged, especially the educational wing. Holes in the roof, many windows broken, an estimated $1 million damage. But the main sanctuary remained intact, and there were church services there the following Sunday. Across the street, Temple Israel Synagogue closed for the foreseeable future because of the damage. Religious services moved to the new Jewish Community Center. The day after the tornado, emergency relief centers like this one at the crossroads were set up. Coordinated by the Red Cross, disaster victims were issued vouchers to buy such things as clothes, shoes, and bedding, outright grants. There was also money for temporary shelter and a month's worth of free food stamps for families. The Salvation Army established two main distribution centers for clothing, canned goods, and furniture. This center in Ralston, set up like a department store from which affected homeowners and renters were invited to pick up needed goods. The Salvation Army had all its emergency equipment in action one half hour after the tornado hit, including mobile canteens, a communications van, and citizens' van radio units. The designation of the Omaha tornado as the worst in the nation's history in terms of property damage is due in large part to the damage inflicted to businesses and industries. From 84th and L through the industrial track just south of the interstate, into 74th and Pacific, then up 72nd, the twister severely damaged or destroyed more than 100 firms. It's doubtful that some, like the downtowner motel, will ever rebuild. Damage to the motel alone estimated at more than $5 million. What has been known as Omaha Strip, 72nd from Dodge to Pacific, was left in shamble. All that's left of the Nebraska Furniture Mart is a shell. Most everything inside was destroyed. 50 customers and employees in the building sought refuge in a basement bomb shelter, which up until the tornado had been a joke among store employees. Across the street, the Farmers Union Casualty Insurance Building was sheared to the ground. At 74th and Pacific, the Seidel's Warehouse, containing millions of dollars in large appliances, was cut in half by the tornado. 
By Saturday, federal disaster teams established what were called one-stop disaster relief centers. The first day, more than 500 disaster victims had been processed through the centers at Ralston High School in southwest Omaha and Hillside Elementary School in the northern end of the disaster area. At these centers, disaster victims received assistance in obtaining temporary housing information on small business loans, unemployment compensation, and tax assistance. The weekend following the twister was designated for cleanup. The city asked for volunteers and thousands responded. They gathered at the West Auditorium on L Street. Sign up right over here. I don't know yet. And at the Kmart parking lot at 71st and A. They were formed into work crews and moved to specific areas for the cleanup. They got a picture of a tank. At least 5,000 persons participated in the cleanup on Saturday. There were more than 800 vehicles, trucks, and heavy equipment to load up and take out the debris, including city equipment and many donated vehicles. Residents in the affected areas piled the debris from around their homes on the right-of-way next to the street where it was picked up. Only about 600 volunteers showed up on Sunday. A rainfall that day believed part of the reason. So a lot of debris remained, and at the request of Mayor Zerinsky, school students who wished to volunteer were released from classes Monday and Tuesday. Some 5,000 students responded over the two days, and on Tuesday, May 13th, one week after the tornado, please city officials declared that part of the volunteer program at an end. The debris from this cleanup program was trucked to several locations, this one at the south end of Pipple Park. The debris was set ablaze, and the resulting bonfires burned into the night. About 1,000 homes and 100 businesses were damaged or destroyed in the May 6 tornado. But we still don't know for sure how much the tornado cost in terms of dollars. The final figure is expected sometimes this summer, a figure considerably under the $1.5 billion estimate issued in the first days afterwards. Ralph Medina, operations officer for the Nebraska Civil Defense Agency, who was compiling damage statistics, early this year put the total at just over $111 million. He estimates it might go as high as 120 million when other figures are available this summer. The National Severe Storms Forecast Center in Kansas City is sticking with its designation of the Omaha tornado as the worst in the nation's history in terms of property damage based on an estimate of $160 million. These numbers don't mean much, of course, to the individuals affected by this tragedy. Theirs was a personal struggle, often an heroic struggle, to rebuild not only their homes and businesses, but lives as well. So for the remainder of this program, we're going to go back into each of the affected areas and see what has happened in the past year, as well as visit with an Omaha policeman who literally rode with the tornado. We start this series of reports by Channel 6 newsmen with Ray Deppa at the point the tornado first touched down. The tornado began its nine-mile destructive trip through Omaha here on the city's southwestern fringe in a subdivision known to the people who live here as Bay Meadows. They were the first to feel the furious effects of the storm, the first of thousands in Omaha to have their lives rearranged by it. 
This is what Bay Meadows looked like one year ago today. 60 homes either totally destroyed or severely damaged. Many of the homes built only a year or two before the tornado. Today, very little evidence of that tornado remains. Every home, with the exception of one, has been rebuilt, and nearly everyone stayed. In conversations with area residents, we were able to count only six families who sold their property and moved. Many persons here in Bay Meadows and elsewhere were able to rebuild as the result of disaster loans from the federal government's Small Business Administration. The 5% loans are designed to make up the difference between the insurance settlement and the actual cost of rebuilding the home. As of today, the SBA has approved 259 home loans for a total exceeding $3 million. Bay Meadows residents Frank and Mona Zavorka are among the majority who decided to stay. I think you always have to have a right state of mind. I mean, you know, you just can't fall over and just give up. You just pick up your things just like, you know, normal and like start all over. But the past year has not been without frustration. Well, there the, the builder couldn't get started and and there'd be many times we'd go past and be nothing done. And, uh, but it isn't the builder's fault. It was, you know, weather-wise and stuff. And I think it took us from, what was it, June? Or July he started, and we moved in December 15th. 15th. And then the first day we moved in, there was a tornado warning. <laughs> <laughs> so December kinda, 15th, you know. That shook my wife up. Uh, yeah, I would tend to shake her. <laughs> Every time now there's a, uh, a thunderstorm or a uh, clouds get black or something, she gets real edgy. After whetting its appetite on homes in Bay Meadows, the swirling cloud of destruction tore through the Wentworth apartment complex. 70% of the units were heavily damaged, and even today, much rebuilding needs to be done. Wentworth, beset with financial problems before the tornado, has been divided among three real estate management firms. Those portions handled by Dial Realty and the Botel Company have not been totally reconstructed. All of the units managed by NP Dodge have now been repaired. Nowhere in southwest Omaha are the tornado scars more visible than in this one block stretch of South 84th Street. Three of the five houses in this small area have not been rebuilt, and they probably won't be. The Hagers once lived here. The Hagers have built a new home six blocks east. Their decision to move was based partly on the undesirable traffic volume of 84th Street. The emotional strain caused by the tornado was a secondary factor, but an important one. Coming home tonight from work, I got off the bus down 80th and Q, and I could smell the lilacs and all the other spring flowers coming across over here. You couldn't smell them over there. All you'd smell is traffic fumes. <laughs> Exhaust fumes. <laughs> Exhaust fumes. You'd have to wait in his driveway about seven to ten minutes some morning, too, you know, to get out to go to work. This is kind of, you know was so. a factor, I think that, and emotional factor after the tornado, because we go back there and we still think about the tornado, of course it looks, you know, like it did after it hit too, but um, I think emotionally that you're better off getting in a different area and getting, you know, to try to forget. The Hagers have tried to sell their property, but no one else wants it for the same reasons. They're hoping to get the land zoned commercial. At this point, a tornado, having skipped over the Union Pacific Railroad tracks, slammed into the Westgate area, across Nina, Pasadena, Ontario, and Grover Streets, and up 78th and 79th Street until it hit Westgate Elementary School and destroyed it. The statistics for Westgate read 60 to 75 homes severely damaged or totally demolished. No dead, many injured, and a damage estimate as high as $4 million. The only visible scars of the devastation one year ago are the trees. Perhaps the most amazing recovery has been that of Westgate School itself. Classes reopened in September of last year, just one week later than usual. The biggest problem as far as I was concerned was the, the business of time and the stress that goes along with having a very limited amount of time to get things done. And I have reference to getting book orders in, getting supply orders in, getting furniture orders in, 
and all of this had to be done in a very short period of time. But today, there is no indication of that $1.3 million in damage. There is, however, a little more open space in the classrooms, more room in the multipurpose area, and a tornado shelter underground to house the 436 students. Since no one except the building custodian was in the school at the time, no one was injured, and the shock effect of the destruction has been minimal, according to Alexander. It seems to me that uh, the children have made a good adjustment uh, if they seem to be enthused about moving back or coming back into a, a new school and all the activities that were involved in rebuilding. So I, I, I really don't think it's been a great problem. I'm sure that there are some that probably will appear occasionally, and I'm sure that on occasion during certain weather conditions that problems might present themselves. But overall, I think that the adjustment has been great. That was an actual tape recording of the tornado as it plowed through houses on either side of Nina Street last May 6th. Since then, according to Douglas County records, area residents have rebuilt and in many instances improved their homes to the tune of almost two million dollars. One of those who rebuilt bigger is Glenn Myers, who lives at 7907 Nina Street. Oh, well, we've had a pretty tough summer out of it. We did, we worked all summer long building the house. In fact, we worked on it up until about Christmas, where we really got it, where we could relax a little bit. So last summer was just kind of a wasted summer, just, just building, <laughs> no vacation or anything. How do you feel about it now that you, that you have your house rebuilt plus some? Oh, we like it now. It's home again for us now. It really is. Took a little bit getting used to it. It's a little bit bigger than we had before. It's brand new, but uh, we like it. Myers was one of the injured as he kept a steel beam from falling on his son throughout the tornado. The beam hit Myers' back, severely injuring him, but then he held on to the 36-foot piece of steel throughout the storm, a feat he is convinced he could not duplicate today. Neighborhood residents say that between 10 and 20 families have moved out of the area since last May. The last house to be rebuilt in the area is presently in the final stages on Grover Street. The desire to remain in the area more than any other attitude stands out among the people interviewed. Well, I think right away uh, my first reaction was, uh, uh, can we uh, cope with all this and wouldn't it be just easier to go find some other place to live? But after talking to the neighborhood ladies and everybody seemed to say, come on, we can do it, let's, let's all come back. And, and we liked living here in Westgate, so uh, I think we made the right decision. Easier to understand, but an indication of deeper significance, is the apprehension about stormy weather. Last week when we had that tornado watch, uh, <laughs> it was kind of like terrible around here. Kids were, I got home from work and the kids were, well, they had the candles out, flashlights, uh, transistor radios, and they're all standing looking at the sky. So uh, we was a little scared, we really was. I think that uh, the children really are the ones that uh, really feel this um, terrible traumatic feeling. Uh, our youngest especially, uh, the first time that we had the tornado watch in this area, and of course it was during our supper hour, and she certainly couldn't relax. She was uh, trying to eat, but mostly tears, and uh, she just kind of had to walk away. She
Since the early 1960s, this prosperous commercial block on 72nd Street has been known as the Strip. But the tornado quickly transformed it from the Strip to the Stripped, inflicting a staggering $10 million damage to buildings alone. The destruction was witnessed by this man, 24-year-old Omaha Police Patrolman David Campbell, who may hold the dubious distinction of being nearer a tornado longer than anyone else in history. Campbell came on duty only a few minutes before the tornado struck. When the twister began its rampage through southwest Omaha, he was assigned to 72nd and the interstate to block traffic. Moments later, the funnel appeared, heading straight for him. But the twister changed directions and went down 72nd Street. Campbell decided to follow it and rode near the eye of the storm until it returned to the sky some 20 minutes later. I'd never seen a tornado before, and when I saw it, it really fascinated me. I just happened to be in the right location at the right time, and um, they had been giving locations of the tornado, which interests everybody on the street, so they know where it's coming, so they don't themselves get themselves killed. And I'm coming down the interstate, and there it is. And I had blocked off traffic. And I was thinking, what else can I do? Here's this uh, large storm destroying things. And, and uh, nobody had given location except at the interstate. And I'm thinking, hey, these guys downtown or whatever are wondering where it's at. So I says, why don't I try to stay with it and give locations? But I didn't think it was going to do what it did. On the police radio, dispatchers who'd been following the twister since it was first spotted began instituting emergency procedures. 3453, 3453, 3453, you better clear the air for emergency traffic. Clear the air for emergency traffic, 1640. Clear the air for emergency traffic, 1640. Patrolman Campbell kept his report short and to the point. His siren blaring in the background, he watched as the tornado approached Bergen Mercy Hospital. <laughs> As I come down the hill there, the tornado was just about ready to hit Bergen Mercy. And when I paused there for a second at the intersection, and it did hit there, and it threw the cars around in the parking lot and did uh, considerable damage to the top of the uh, hospital. And then it continued on up towards the hill, towards Pacific Street. It took more than five months and three million dollars to clean up and repair the hospital, which today appears unblemished. From Bergen Mercy, the tornado moved towards 72nd and Pacific. Once there, it devastated the massive Seidel's Distributing Company, causing millions of dollars in damage. An employee of a restaurant across the street was killed when she was pinned by debris in the basement of a building. One year later, workers are still putting the finishing touches on a giant warehouse addition, part of a massive rebuilding program undertaken by the firm. For Patrolman Campbell, the destruction of the Seidel's building was one sign of even more unbelievable sights to come. The twister had now entered the strip, with Campbell close behind. Just come down the hill and it come over on the north side of Denny's. And it went right down 72nd Street and there was some cars in the road and the tornado picked them up and was throwing them uh, off the side of the road and on the buildings and buildings started exploding and the roofs were coming off and transformers were exploding and there's flames and you name it, it was flying everywhere. Electricity was uh, flying, telephone poles start coming down. In 72nd Howard Street, I remember the gas station there, it just started getting windier and windier, and all of a sudden the gas pumps, the signs, the building, everything was gone. You know, sometimes I had to go uh, over the curb. Uh, sometimes there was a little opening between the cars and the telephone poles. There was a lot of water, so you couldn't really see what was low onto the street. And I just kept weaving my way along and keeping in contact with radio what the location of the tornado was. I did get through. As the tornado roared up the street, it struck first to the left, then to the right. The Nebraska furniture store was gutted, with hundreds of items thrown about its showroom floor. One year later, the store looks much as it did before the storm, with a new roof, 
new merchandise, and a new grand opening sale. Across the street, a twisted pipe and the outline of a foundation are all that remains of the Farmers Union Co-op Insurance Company, which was literally flattened by the twister. The firm has sold this land and is preparing to rebuild at 117th and Dodge. Next to it, workers have been laying the foundation for a fast food outlet on land where a big restaurant once stood. As Patrolman Campbell approached the city's busiest intersection at 72nd and Dodge, he relayed to radio operators a vivid description of the scene. Go ahead, 360. Go ahead. Cars are flying through the air, buildings are being destroyed. Well, usually at that time of the day, this is peak hour traffic, and it's just jammed, car to car and everywhere. Well, at this time, there wasn't a car in sight. By the time the tornado got this far, the, possibly the people knew that it was coming, and they left the area. And, I figured uh, if it hits Brandeis, I says, is it going to stay up? You know, I didn't know if it was going to knock it down or if it was that strong or what, but it didn't. It went over towards the east side of the street and took care of the downtown area. And uh, the roofs of that place, it just blew off, sucked all the roofs off and was throwing things everywhere. And, and Wolf Brothers was destroyed. And it continued up towards the church up by Western Street. It took nearly a year just to clean up the debris from the motel as insurance and real estate interests sparred over damaged settlements. Whatever the outcome, the total loss is expected to exceed $4 million. A sign on the property indicates the land is for sale, but all that stands now are some battered trees and a few posts. Across the street, the Wolf Brothers Clothing Company took the opportunity to completely redesign their building a colorful Old West facade has replaced the tangled mass of metal and mortar which the tornado left behind. By the time it left the strip, the storm had taken one life, caused millions of dollars in damage, and left the area in shambles. Patrolman Campbell, meanwhile, continued the chase, prompting this ironic exchange between the battered cruiser and the 9-11 radio center. My lines are going out. I got a brick through my windshield. If that changes direction on you, leave at once. If that changes direction towards you, leave the area at once. I think afterwards I was more scared for the next couple days because I had a little problem sleeping. But at the time, there was too much going on. I had to drive the car, keep my mind straight so that I could talk under the radio and get my broadcast down to the the uh, central station to the other cruiser, cruisers and uh, when you're driving a cruiser and you're going the full works you don't have time to be scared at that time. In the months since the tornado Campbell has transferred to a northwest Omaha district. Sometimes en route to the area he takes the same path down 72nd he followed during the tornado. A lot of people remember what the twister did to the strip but none of them remember it so vividly as the man who risked his life so near the eye of the storm. From the strip area, the tornado, continuing on its northeast course, traveled only a short distance here to 70th and Cath Street. First, the tornado hit the Temple Israel Synagogue, next, the Community Playhouse, and then jumped across the street to leave its mark on the First Methodist Church. It was difficult at the time to estimate monetary losses to buildings and homes. Even now, one year later, the figures are still, at best, estimates. The Playhouse sets its loss at about one-half million dollars. Temple Israel's building project fund is one million dollars, having already spent several hundreds of thousands of dollars repairing the sanctuary and church offices. The educational wing, the area of the church hardest hit, is still far from completion. Activities of school, churches, and of course individual families were thrown into chaos. The workings of the Temple Israel Synagogue have been spread literally all over the city. Not until last Friday, almost one year later, did Rabbi Brooks hold the first service at Temple Israel since May 2nd, 1975, bringing the congregation home again.
Lewis and Clark Junior High School was the next large building to be hit. And not until April 19th of this year were students and teachers able to return to their academic home and their regular schedules. The residential area between 72nd and 68th Streets from Cass to Maple Street, houses were left in shambles. Estimates provided by the Metro Area Planning Agency say an estimated 530 single-family dwellings were damaged or destroyed, doing more than $16 million in structural damage alone. Nevertheless, today most of the homes have been rebuilt, some are still working on their homes, and all the residents are carrying on. The Charles Geisler family is just one of many such families in the neighborhood who never doubted what they would do after the tornado. In fact, the Geislers' reaction was almost immediate. Why did you decide to rebuild at such an extreme cost? Well, we had built it originally the way we liked it. We liked the neighborhood, and um, we wanted to be here. Was it extremely difficult to stay here to start over? Oh, yes. Uh, if you recall, we camped out in the living room for about, uh, what, a month before mm -hmm. we were able to find temporary quarters. And uh, in that respect, we had no utility other than the uh, water. Uh, we had propane stoves and gas lights and things of that nature. And it was just like I say, like camping on. If we had to do over again, I think we'd do it again. I do. I, uh, I'm kind of stubborn, and so she. <laughs> I think we'd do it again. I really do. Creighton Prep High School was next, followed by Baker's Supermarket on the corner of 72nd and Blondo. Both locations reopened in the fall. But there were other businesses, most notably the Imperial 400 gas station on the corner of 69th and Maple, where one of the three fatalities occurred, which never rebuilt. Other businesses in that area, however, reacted much the same as did homeowners and were anxious to rebuild and to reopen. Why did you want to stay here? Good location. Uh, our insurance was more than adequate to cover the, cover the damage, and we just never thought of moving. Good customer. What we lost, you know, we could operate without, uh, but uh, we couldn't, uh, you know, there just wasn't any place to go. We have a lot of customers that know where we are, and we decided that we'd just go ahead and rebuild it. And, stay here and rebuild it while we continue to work. From southwest Omaha, where it first touched down, to near this point at 67th and Military, the tornado had left behind it a 15-mile line of complete and total devastation. But at this site, the tornado lifted, and the massive destruction was over. When we walked these streets a year ago tonight and picked our way through the shattered remains of once pleasant homes and bustling places of business, we had no idea we would be able to bring to you the year after report that you have seen tonight. The fact that Omaha was able to recover so well in the brief span of 12 months from one of the worst natural disasters in the city's history is testimony, we believe, to the hard work, to the quiet courage, to the unflinching spirit of the people themselves. This report has been our way of saluting all of you out there for proving us wrong in our misgivings as we stood amid the debris of Tornado 75 just one year ago tonight. I'm Gary Kerr. Good evening. This Channel 6 News special report, the Omaha Tornado one year later, has been brought to you by the Nebraska Furniture Mart and Blue Cross Blue Shield.